L'image VLK. L'image VAP. Welcome back, everyone, to another hot installment of Space This Week, the weekly show in which I talk about space. I guess actually the title is fairly self-explanatory. Anyway, we have lots to talk about from rockets to virtual reality to the overpowered nature of Tuesdays. Yes, it's going to be a deep one, guys. Let's get right into our first segment, all the major space events that happened last week. So, to kick things off, on August the 15th, we finally saw the successful launch of the Ariane 5 Flight VA-253. It'll be a bittersweet goodbye for me as we've managed to mention this launch on every episode of Space this week so far, due to it getting persistently delayed for one reason or another. But I am certainly very pleased to finally see it take flight. On board were three payloads. The first was the Galaxy 30, an ultra-high definition video distribution, broadcast and broadband satellite for Intelsat's North American fleet. The second passenger is the Mission Extension Vehicle 2, or MEV-2, which is a satellite servicing vehicle designed to dock with satellites in orbit to provide life extension services. The MEV-2's first customer will be the Intelsat 1002 satellite, which has been in service since 2004 and will have its operational life extended by five years, courtesy of the MEV-2. The final passenger on board the Ariane 5 was the BSAT-4B satellite, which will be used for ultra-high-definition direct-to-home television broadcasting across Japan, in conjunction with its twin, BSAT-4A, which was launched in 2017. In Starship news now, we saw the SN6 move to the launch pad, ready for testing. Elon Musk has confirmed that SpaceX are planning to try several short hops, so it looks like the SN6 will be walking into the air sometime soon. It also looks like we haven't heard the last of the SN5 either. When Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut, questioned Musk about the future of the SN5 and if we can expect more flights, Musk replied with a cautious, uh, hopefully. <laughs> also in Starship news, we got glimpses of the SN9's common dome, confirming that the next Starship after the SN8 is well into production. And speaking of the SN8, construction seems to be proceeding as planned, which is of course always excellent news, as the SN8 will be the first flight test vehicle for full-scale Starship hardware to come complete with nose cone and fins. And of course, with the very exciting objective of testing the spacecraft during high-altitude flight. Completion of the SN8 will definitely be a groundbreaking milestone. Finally, on Twitter, Jim Bridenstine announced that NASA and SpaceX are targeting no earlier than October 23rd for Crew Dragon's first operational mission. This is very exciting news, but really it's not that unexpected given the roaring success of the Demo 2 mission. SpaceX Crew 1 will carry Crew Dragon Commander Michael Hopkins, Pilot Victor Glover, Mission Specialist Shannon Walker, and Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency Mission Specialist Soichi Naguchi to the International Space Station for a six-month mission. To complete last week's news, we have a follow-up to Virgin Galactic's reveal of Spaceship 2's interior, a story we covered on this series a couple of weeks ago. Virgin have announced a cool virtual reality app, available on the App Store and the Play Store, which will allow users to tour the Spaceship 2 cabin in awe-inspiring detail. I'll whack some links in the description if you want to check this one out. Uh, by the way, this video isn't sponsored by Virgin, but Virgin, please, if you want to hook me up with some free tickets to space, then let me know, I'll, and I'll happily, I'll happily shill your apps in the future. <sighs> anyway, um, that about wraps things up for everything that happened last week. Let's take a look at what the next seven days have in store for us. Tomorrow, on Tuesday the 18th of August, we will see the launch of SpaceX's Starlink 10 mission, and on a ceremonial note, this will be SpaceX's 100th mission. Starlink's 11th batch of satellites will be blasting into the heavens atop a Falcon 9 launch vehicle as per usual, pushing SpaceX further toward their goal of delivering worldwide high-speed internet. Coming along for the ride this time will be three Earth observation satellites for Planet Lab, which will join their current Skysat constellation of 18 other imaging satellites. August has so far been a glorious month for SpaceX with the safe return of the Crew Dragon, the launch of hopefully two Starlink missions, and of course the very impressive 150 meter hop for Starship SN5. I am definitely looking forward to see what this company manages to pull over the rest of the year and indeed the next few years. 
Next up, but also tomorrow, on August the 18th, we will see a Japanese resupply ship depart the ISS after spending nearly three months aboard. The remotely controlled Canadarm2 will grapple and remove the H2 Transfer Vehicle 9, also referred to simply as HTV9, or the Kunatori 9 from the Harmony module. Commander Chris Cassidy will instruct Canadarm2 to release the cargo craft into space, where it will orbit for two days before re-entering the atmosphere above the South Pacific Ocean. This operation will be the end of an era, as the HTV-9 is the last HTV of the original model, with future missions planned to use the improved HTV-X spacecraft, the first flight of which is expected to take place in February 2022. Finally, but again on Tuesday the 18th, we will see a new moon. The moon will sit directly between the sun and earth, so the side of the moon facing us will receive no direct sunlight. This will make the sky nice and dark, so more stars should be visible and you may even be able to see the Kappa Cygnids meteor shower, which peaks tonight on August the 17th. So boys and girls, don't forget to look out of your window tonight and make a wish. And that's it, actually. <laughs> Not too many major events happening over the next seven days, and somehow they all managed to take place on the same day, August the 18th, Tuesday. Tuesday, you need to calm down there, mate. Let the other days have a go. <laughs> anyway, we must now move right along to my favourite segment of this show, This Week in Space History. We begin our history segment with American astronomer Asaf Hall's discovery of Mars's largest moon, Phobos, on the 17th of August 1877, just five days after the discovery of Mars's smaller moon, Deimos. Phobos is the closest moon to Mars, orbiting at around 6,000 kilometers above the Martian surface, which makes it the closest orbiting moon to any primary body that we currently know of. Phobos is so close to Mars, in fact, that its orbital velocity is faster than Mars's rotation. The moon completes an orbit in a speedy 7 hours and 39 minutes. When human explorers one day touch down on the red planet, Phobos will look similar to how Venus appears from Earth, and as a result of its speed, it will rise in the west and traverse the sky in just 4 hours and 15 minutes before setting in the east, and it will do this twice per day. Despite being Mars's largest moon, Phobos only has a mean radius of 11.26 kilometers, and it doesn't have enough mass to be rounded under its low gravity. It's also one of the least reflective bodies in the solar system, and its surface composition shows similarities to Mars's. Beneath the ground, we know that it's not solid rock, and it has significant porosity. Because of this, some theories postulate that Phobos could contain a substantial ice reservoir. Our last little fact about Phobos is that it has many craters, the most prominent of which is named after Asaf Hall's wife, Stickney, which was her maiden name. At 9 kilometers long, this crater takes up a massive proportion of the surface, the impact which created it nearly shattered the moon completely. Unfortunately, the speedy little Phobos cannot last forever. It gets close to Mars by about 2 meters every 100 years, which means that in around 30 to 50 million years time, it will either crash into the planet or break up into a planetary ring. Next up for space history is the unfortunate passing of Robert R. Gilruth on August the 17th, 2000. Gilruth was commonly described as a quiet character. He was never really interested in fame, and yet he was a NASA director with Mercury, Gemini, and the Apollo program all running under his leadership at the NASA Manned Spacecraft Center. Gilruth's work was heavily dictated by the Cold War. While working as an assistant director of the Pilotless Aircraft Research Division of NACA, he requested a program to launch satellites into space. The administrators at the time disagreed with this idea, right up until the Soviets launched Sputnik. Suddenly, America feared falling behind the Soviets in the space exploration race, and Congress passed the National Aeronautics and Space Act of 1958. Gilruth was heavily involved in the transition of NACA to NASA, and he was named head of the Space Task Group. His job? Get a man on the moon before the Soviets. He approached his job with a calm caution and was very worried when President John F. Kennedy announced that they would put a man on the moon before the end of the 1960s. Gilruth wasn't sure if this could be accomplished. He knew NASA would need to learn a lot more about operating in space before they could send a man to go and walk on the moon, and so he helped to develop the Gemini program, which would help develop the space travel techniques that would be required by Apollo. He led the Manned Spacecraft Center for the rest of his working life, and he was awarded the Collier Trophy alongside the Apollo 15 crew in 1971. He would retire one year later. 
Maybe it is his quiet character that is responsible for him being a somewhat forgotten part of the history of space exploration, but I felt it was important that we remember the man who calmly led the team that would see the first ever man walk on the moon. Overseas in the Soviet Union, we had the launch of the Korobol Sputnik 2 on August 19th, 1960, using a Vostok L carrier rocket. This was a Vostok test spacecraft carrying two dogs, who had become the first living beings recovered from orbit. This was the uh, second attempt to launch a Vostok capsule with living beings on board, following the Soviet Union's first attempt on the 28th of July that unfortunately suffered vehicle disintegration around 30 seconds after launch. The flight controllers did attempt to jettison the payload shroud and separate the descent module, but sadly the parachutes didn't deploy completely and the dogs on board were killed upon impact. This caused quite an uproar. <laughs> the designers tracked down the issue as a manufacturing problem and the accident led to the design of the ejector seat, which would allow a person on board to escape in such an emergency. So there were some upsides to this launch failure. You can imagine that the Soviets were watching the second launch attempt with bated breath and at around 8.40 a.m. the Korobol Sputnik 2 launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome after which it would complete four orbits over a roughly 21 hour period landing again on the 20th of August at around 6 o'clock in the morning. On board the craft were the two dogs, Belka and Strelka, as well as many other biological specimens including a grey rabbit, rodents, plants and human skin. They also included a television camera so that they could observe the dogs while they were in space. A year after landing, Strelka had puppies, <laughs> one of which was presented to the Kennedys as a gift from the Soviets. When Belka and Strelka passed, their bodies were preserved with taxidermy and are still on display at the Moscow Museum of Space and Aeronautics. Next up, we had the United States' first attempt at landing on Mars. On the 20th of August 1975, the Viking 1 orbiter launched from Cape Canaveral aboard a Titan 3E rocket. The Viking 1 would become the second spacecraft to soft land on Mars and the first to successfully perform its mission as the first lander, the Soviet Mars 3, failed 110 seconds after landing, having transmitted only a grey image with no details. The Viking 1 landed on the 20th of July 1976, the seventh anniversary of Apollo, and it took its first images a mere 25 seconds later. It would take the first ever colour photos from the Mars surface, and it managed to capture this incredible 300 degree panoramic landscape. It wasn't only designed to take photos though, it also carried biological experiments designed to search for life. Most experiments didn't really find any signs of life. One appeared to initially, but unfortunately this is now contested as scientists believe that this was due to inorganic chemical reactions of the soil, meaning that the Viking one never found any conclusive sign of life. It did, however, confirm the phenomenon of gravitational time dilation, which is that time will pass slower in regions of lower gravitational potential. Scientists sent radio signals to the lander and instructed it to send back signals in return. They found that the gravitational time delay matched the prediction for gravitational time dilation. So even if this little lander struggled to find signs of biological life, it did manage to prove a concept in the theory of relativity and it took some cracking photos to boot. The Viking 1 earned the record for longest Mars surface mission, clocking in at 2,245 Martian solar days. That record was eventually broken by Opportunity on the 19th of May 2010. Rest in peace, Oppie. Rest in peace. Finally, saving arguably the best until last, we have the launch of the Voyager 2. This probe flew into the heavens from Cape Canaveral on August 20th, 1977, aboard a Titan Centaur rocket. Its brother, Voyager 1, was launched on a similar rocket a few weeks later on September the 5th. The Voyager goal was to study Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. The Voyager 2's closest approach to Jupiter was on the 9th of July 1979 and it took some great photos of the Great Red Spot and of Jupiter's moons. It also confirmed active volcanoes on the moon Io, which were first noticed by Voyager 1 but it only managed to send some low res images back. Voyager 2 by comparison managed to get some pretty decent high res shots. Next up, it flew by Saturn. The closest approach occurred on the 26th of August 1981. It took some amazing pictures, but the camera platform locked up briefly during this time, so it was a little bit restricted. Luckily, engineers were able to fix the problems so that it could continue on to Uranus and Neptune. The 
closest approach to Uranus occurred on January the 24th, 1986, and the Voyager 2 discovered 11 new moons. It also found two new rings around Uranus, which we believe to be a very young ring system. Very recently, in March 2020, NASA astronomers re-evaluated the data recorded by Voyager 2 and determined that it showed a plasmoid, which is a large atmospheric magnetic bubble, being released into space for 60 seconds of its 45 hour long flyby. The next planet visited by Voyager 2 was Neptune. On August the 25th, 1989, the spacecraft had its closest approach. There, it photographed the planet, discovering the great dark spot six new moons and new Neptunian rings. Voyager 2 didn't give up once it had completed its primary mission and bravely began its new one, Explore Deep Space. On November the 5th, 2018, it left the heliosphere and entered the interstellar medium, a region of outer space beyond the influence of the solar system, becoming the second man-made object to leave the solar system, right behind Voyager 1. Should it uncover any life on its interstellar journey, it will be able to say a warm hello from Earth. Both voyagers carry a golden record that includes greetings in many languages, music, images, and sounds from Earth. It is still exploring deep space to this day and has begun to provide the first direct measurements of the density and temperature of the interstellar plasma, and we can expect to keep receiving radio signals until the mid-2020s at least. And on Thursday, it'll celebrate its 43rd year in operation. Happy birthday to the plucky explorer. And that concludes my summary of all my favorite things that happened in space history this week. And that about wraps things up for space this week. Guys, I do hope you enjoyed this episode and, uh, and by extension are enjoying this series. I am certainly having a blast making it. And if you'd like to check out more, there's now a, we've now got a playlist for it. A link to that is on the left-hand side of your screen. The right-hand side is just a video chosen for you by YouTube's recommendation algorithm based on your viewing habits. I think I've said my piece now, so I'm going to leave it there. Goodbye.